All right, good morning. Good morning and welcome to Grand Rounds. The construction noise notwithstanding, we are very, very excited to be back here in person and I kudos to our chief residents, always making a very strong showing and breakfast is served. And, and as another reminder that we are here physically, we are going to start each week with the university land acknowledgement shown here and recognizing that Stanford sits on ancestral land of the Muwakema Ohani tribe. Um, so this, this will now become part of our routine each morning or each Friday when we welcome everybody to Grand Rounds. Um, as well, we want to make sure everyone's aware of the opportunity to get CME and MOC Part 2 credit using the text code here. It's unique each week. Make a note of that. Um, and then for those of you that um, are on joining us by Zoom, it is available through the numbers will be available through the chat. So as always, as we kick off uh, Grand Rounds, want to make sure everyone's aware of what's upcoming. Um, so we're very delighted to have for the Ben Ephraim Family Endowed Lectureship in Pediatric, Par uh, Pediatric Palliative Care. Dr. McCauley from Oregon Health and Science University is going to speak on responding to parental requests for potentially non-beneficial treatment. This is a very exciting time here at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital as we've just established a division of palliative care within the Department of Pediatrics, and you'll be hearing a lot more about that. Um, but this particular topic I know is one that's just come up recently, and so really looking forward to that endowed lectureship. And then another part of the work that the Pediatric Grand Rounds Program Committee does is working with other departments across the School of Medicine, sometimes across the campus, and so the following week, Grand Rounds uh, is a representation of our partnership with P um, pediatric psychiatry. We're going to be hearing about uh, adolescent suicide prevention. Very much appreciate that guest speaker. Um, and with that, I'm going to invite Dr. Lance Prince, Chief of the Division of Neonatology, to introduce today's speaker. just want to say personally a congratulations that CAPE, the Center for Advanced Pediatric Education, just celebrated its 20th anniversary. And it's a perfect time for Dr. Nicole Yamada to come speak to us about that work. Welcome, Lance. Thank you and good morning. It's my uh, true pleasure to introduce Dr. Nicole Yamato who's gonna give grand rounds today. Uh, Nicole is an associate professor of pediatrics in the division of uh, neonatal and developmental medicine. Um, she has a very distinguished education background. She graduated summa cum laude from UCLA, did her medical school at Washington University in St. Louis, residency at UC San Diego, where she received numerous awards during her training, and then came here to Stanford for fellowship where she's now risen up through the ranks of the faculty. Um, maybe not all the way yet, but she's getting there. Um, uh, but she's also been very, very uh, successful in her career in um, developing a, really the cutting edge of human factors research. Uh, she's received a K-08 award uh, for her work. Um, she has published numerous really high impact uh, articles. Uh, she is now a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics NRP Steering Committee, the American Heart Association Writing Group, uh, and really become very active across the country and in, internationally in pushing what we can uh, think, how we think about resuscitation and uh, clinical performance. And to me, uh, just to kind of tell you my perspective on Nicole's work, I think what's most impressive is that I think we would all agree that, that um, you know, simulation is a good idea. Practice is good. Anything we can do to make our teams more effective is obviously a very good thing. But Nicole's work has really delved into the why. You know, why are some people and some teams better performers than others? And how can we make sure that all of us are doing the best that we can to care for our patients and pushing our abilities to do even better in the future? And, and I think that's what really sets her apart uh, in her work. So it's a pleasure uh, to introduce you, and I look forward to your talk today. Nicole. Thank you, Lance, for that very kind introduction. Um, and thank you, Mary and the Grand Rounds Committee, for the opportunity to speak with everyone today. Um, so as um, you've already all seen is the preview to today's talk. Um, I'm going to speak about how to incorporate human factors in the work that we do to improve our teams through simulation, debriefing, and also looking at the research around team performance. Um, I have no disclosures. So I'll start with acknowledging that for many of you, when we say the word simulation, I suspect that um, a common image that might come to mind is something like this. Um, but over the course of the next 35, 45 minutes, um, as we go through this talk, I hope that I can help you understand why when I think of simulation, I think more of an image like this. Um, and I recognize that both of these images depict uh, resuscitation. 
Um, and that's because a huge proportion of healthcare simulation is really focused and has a lot of its genesis in emergency situations. Um, but the concepts of human factors and the use of simulation and debriefing um, to improve our performance can really extend to any aspect of healthcare. Um, and so as we go through this content today, I encourage each of you to think about the ways that we can apply these concepts to the areas that you work in and the teams that you work with, um, regardless of whether or not it's actually related to resuscitation or emergency care. So just to do a little bit of an overview, this is um, at least one definition of simulation-based learning. It comes from Lou Halamik, who's also uh, the founder of CAPE um, here at Stanford. And he describes it as a methodology for learning in which individuals are immersed in an environment filled with realistic visual, auditory, and tactile cues. They have to integrate cognitive, technical, and behavioral skills. And again, in the context of resuscitation or emergency care, there can definitely be intense time pressure. Um, and then importantly, simulation is always followed by the opportunity to reflect on a team's performance in the form of a, some type of debriefing. Thinking about how to make simulation-based learning most effective and most efficient, it's helpful to break the, thing, the skills um, that uh, any individual might need to learn or any team might need to learn into three categories, cognitive, technical, and behavioral. So cognitive skills are the types of things that we know in our brains. Um, and these are things that actually can be studied and mastered even prior to coming um, and participating in a simulation. These are the things that we might need to study from a textbook or perhaps learn an algorithm or even become familiar with a clinic policy or a patient care protocol. Technical skills are things that we do with our hands, like procedures. Um, and again, these can also be learned and reviewed prior to actually becoming involved in a full-scale simulation um, scenario. And so this um, can be done in things like skill stations with task trainers. So you actually see that um, to highlight it in this photo that you've already seen, this is a partial mannequin. This is actually not a full patient simulator because really the uh, focus in this particular skill station is for the individuals there to learn how to perform chest compressions properly. Technical skills can also encompass learning how to work with a new piece of equipment. So again, trying to draw your minds away from the resuscitation um, setting, thinking about perhaps maybe we're teaching um, new staff how to work with a new piece of equipment or becoming familiar with an um, aspect of um, a device in their environment or um, how to interact with um, something else physically that they might need to um, use in order to facilitate their care of patients. And then finally, behavioral skills actually describe how people would incorporate cognitive and technical skills in order to bring that together and work as a team to take care of patients. And these are really what um, simulation scenarios and simulation learning can really emphasize and give people the opportunity to practice with. And so that's why, again, when I said I think of simulation with much, much more of a complex image, it's because this is an environment that's realistic, you can see people using the actual um, equipment that they might use to take care of a patient. And they're actually working together, incorporating their co cognitive skills, their content knowledge of perhaps this resuscitation algorithm, their technical skills about how to perform a number of procedures, um, securing an airway, performing chest compressions, getting emergency IV access for this patient, and then figuring out how as a team to do that in a comprehensive way that takes best care of this simulated patient. So another lesson that I've learned from Lou is this quote here that he has actually espoused at a number of simulation conferences because a lot of healthcare simulation focuses on really what's exciting and interesting around simulation technology. But at its core, simulation is a methodology and it's simply practicing doing the right thing under realistic conditions. Um, and we often at CAPE make the comparison between simulation and the practice that athletes do, right? Athletes take themselves, their real equipment, their real um, environment. They practice on a field or court that's the same size as the environment that they have to perform at a very high level in. And that's really what simulation is as well. Um, it's just for people who practice in healthcare instead. So I think of simulation as an opportunity to practice, but also um, push it a little bit further and get teams to develop, test, challenge, 
ways that they can come together and practice behavioral skills like leadership, communication, planning, responding to unexpected events, or dealing and responding to error when it occurs, and so much more. But it's really this opportunity for teams to come together and work in a realistic environment um, and improve their performance. Another favorite quote that I have comes from one of the simulation specialists who has worked at Kate for a number of years now, I think probably close to two decades. And she taught me this early in my career. She said, the purpose of the sim is to get to the debriefing. And this is because while the simulation is the opportunity for people to practice, the debriefing is where the learning really takes place. So why is that? Um, again, we've already talked about how the debriefing is an opportunity for people to reflect on their performance. Um, but here, I've also put up on the slide a more in-depth discussion um, or definition of what a debriefing is. And I've highlighted, um, providing my own emphasis on some of what the key factors that I think lie in this definition. So that a debriefing is, some, is a dialogue or a conversation that people have following an action period that allows them to reflect um, and review their performance. They discuss what happened, but more importantly, why it occurred and how they can enhance their performance. So that rather than just moving through a simulation experience as something that you just have to get through, that's actually something the debriefing provides an opportunity to reflect and really learn from that experience. Um, at CAPE, we also talk about how we can learn a lot from other industries that um, perform simulation and debriefings because they work in environments that have a similarly um, uh, high risk to human life. Um, and really in these environments, aerospace, aviation, military, the risk, the risk to human life is often that errors can lead to significant morbidity or really mortality in a lot of these missions. Um, but, and so because of that, these debriefings and the simulations that these teams conduct are all focused on not only the actions of individual team members, but how those actions contributed to the performance of the team. And most importantly, how team performance um, then influences the ability of the team to accomplish their mission or their goals. And again, I think these pictures kind of um, embody a much grander, uh, more impressive perhaps uh, goal. But for us, our daily goal is taking excellent care of patients and safe care of patients. And so when I think about how we can use debriefings following healthcare simulation, I think about how are we as a team achieving our goal of taking the best care of patients. So how can we get to these types of points and talking about our mission in healthcare? Um, there are a number of ways to debrief in healthcare, but what I want to highlight throughout this talk is this series of what we call the drill down questions at CAPE. Um, and I think what many people who come to a debriefing kind of anticipate is this, a series of questions around the concepts of what happened and why did that happen? But it usually is very superficial. It's why did you do that? Or why did that team do that? And what went well and what didn't go well? And oftentimes the conversation stops there. And so with these drill down questions, I think that these are a really valuable way to dig into identifying and addressing how team members can actually support one another in challenging situations. And also to help the team that's being debriefed identify systems errors, um, or even areas for process improvements. And so the way this, this drill down goes is actually in this order. We first stop and talk about what happened or what did you notice in that simulation or at that point in the event. And that's just to get everybody on the same page. So we talk, we know that we're talking about a particular moment in this um, overall clinical event. The next question is what are the circumstances that led to that? And again, that's very specific terminology that we've chosen rather than saying, why did you do that? Or why did that person do that? Or why did the team do that? It's think more broadly. What are the circumstances that led to that? The third question is what happened to the patient as a result? And this brings it back to focusing on the whole event in the context of the mission. So rather than allowing people to sort of go down the rabbit hole of, oh, th these are the mistakes that I made, thinking about, okay, this happened the circumstances that led to it, and how did this ultimately affect the patient in the context of team performance? And then not stopping there, but really getting to this last question, which even as people are starting to use this drill down that I've shown here, people often forget the fourth question, but that's, I think, the most important because we're asking now the team to think about, 
what are ways or solutions that can, that strategies that this team can come up with to either facilitate the recurrence of something that happened that's really positive that you actually want to intentionally replicate again in the future and not leave it to chance, but actually come up with, well, how did this team make this happen? Or if there was a mistake or an error, how can we prevent that negative ha event from happening again? So what can be done to prevent that mistake in the future? A lot of what people bring to debriefings um, and discussion of errors and performance in healthcare, though, is what I've titled here as the human factor, a little bit tongue in cheek in regards to the fact that this whole talk is about human factor science. But the reason why I highlight this is because both debriefers and the people that are being debriefed often bring this perspective into the debriefing, that the quality of our care and whether or not we commit errors is the result of whether or not we were trained well and whether or not we tried hard, and that when mistakes happen, they're a personal failure. Um, and before I learned about the field of human factors, I ascribed to this um, belief here too. Um, I thought we all just needed to train harder and better, and then that would allow us to have um, better performance. So when you think about the field of human factor science, I think this dichotomy that I'll show you here from James Reason, who's a psychologist who has had a huge influence in the field, is a really valuable way to think about it. And so what I've described so far is what he calls the person approach, that when an error occurs, people are blamed, um, and that the focus is on training them to prevent that error from happening again. And that really the underlying thought process is that when errors occur, it's because an individual or a group of individuals had something go wrong in their mental process or the way that they approached the situation. And, it, and it's really negative things like they forgot or they weren't paying attention um, or they weren't motivated enough in that situation to do well and perform at a high level. But in a systems approach, the expectation and the understanding is that humans are at baseline fallible people. They're going to make mistakes regardless. And that really in the systems approach, we actually expect that errors are going to occur. We anticipate that errors are going to happen at some point. And so the focus and the question in the systems approach is not so much why uh, or that, that an error occurred um, in and of itself and who did it, but why and importantly, how and where were the, where were the systems defenses failing that those individuals in supporting them and helping to prevent them from making a mistake? Um, and so it's another way to put it is that errors are thought to be really caused by upstream systemic factors rather than individual human failures. So this is one definition from the International Ergonomics Association um, and another uh, sort of sister name for the human factor science is human factors and ergonomics. Um, and this definition is that human factors and ergonomics is both a scientific discipline and a profession. So it's a scientific discipline that really focuses on understanding what are these interactions between individuals and the systems and the environments that they work in, but also that the people who work as human factors experts um, apply a whole series of theory and principles and data and this understanding about how humans operate in the world to better design and better evaluate how all of our interactions with the things around us um, can be improved. So looking at tasks, the jobs that we have, the products that we interact with, the environments that we work in, where things are positioned around us when we're um, trying to accomplish a task, and even bigger, the systems that we work in. What are the cultural influences that come down to us um, that or permeate through, a, through an organization? What is the, the policies that govern how we behave and how we might react in a situation? Um, and really taking into account how does all of that interface, knowing that humans have needs um, in order to interact most effectively with the environment and with each other, and that they also have strengths and abilities, but limitations. And that in some situations, it's not possible to easily or readily overcome some of those limitations. So how can we make the system and the environment around people uh, more supportive of that? And so that the goal of the human factors field is, <clears throat> excuse me, to optimize human well-being um, in order to improve overall system performance so that the system of the humans and the environments that they're working in 
functions most smoothly and most effectively. Um, human factors is a very interdisciplinary field. <clears throat> and so I've thrown up here just um, some of the types of areas of specialty and study that people who come to human factors um, can come from. So there are people who are experts in psychology or cognitive science, but also engineering, mechanical engineering, kinesiology, epidemiolo epidemiology, and statistics. And they all bring um, their expertise together to study how to best understand the interactions between humans and their systems and how to improve upon those in an iterative fashion. The way to think about human factors can also be broken down into three categories. Um, so there are three domains where people might subspecialize or focus on the work that they do within the human factors field. And these are cognitive, physical, and then social or organizational human factors. And I'll go through kind of what encompasses each of these in the next few slides. So cognitive human factors really focuses on the human ability and limitations to perceive and understand their environment. And so these are people who are experts um, or particularly interested in mental processes like our ability to hold things in our short-term memory and use them in a situation or our ability to perceive the environment around us. And they look at the limitations of the human ear and what are the sound um, decibels that we can hear most easily, what becomes most, uh, or what can become um, an impediment in an environment, or how do we see data around us? Um, and then also getting into how the mind works in terms of problem solving or analyzing situations. And so cognitive human factors, come into play when we think about how to design workspaces, how to make um, tools work more effectively for us, looking at displays, data displays, um, as if we think about uh, like a patient monitor to bedside, and also things like um, care protocols and algorithms that people might have to memorize and work within. Physical human factors refers to understanding how humans physically interact with the environment. Um, and so this is really requires an understanding of our strength and limitations as human beings and a knowledge of our anatomy, physiology, the biomechanics of, again, how do we physically move about in the world? And so physical human factors are a huge focus of ergonomics um, in terms of working postures. How do we design a workstation or how does an individual sit um, and, and in a workplace or stand in a workplace? For example, if you think about applying human factors to a manufacturing plant, there's a huge number of physical human factors that apply there. And then finally, organizational or social human factors are concerned with what I talked about, those broader, the macro level, so macro ergonomics, um, social interactions of people and the organizational policies or structures that might influence how people work within a system. And so what comes into play when we think about organizational or social human factors are things like teamwork and communication, but again, also those structures and policies that govern the rules of how we all interact with one another um, when we're in a team. Uh, so another way to pull all of this together is to actually think about how human factor science really calls out that the interactions of humans with one another and their working environment can affect performance. Recognizing and accepting that things like memory capacity, fatigue, um, the effect of interruptions, organizational policies, and team dynamics can affect human and team performance. And that the human factors field works to optimize the environmental factors that allow uh, it to be easier to overcome some of these limitations. And so I like this quote here that human factor solutions make it easy to do things right and hard to do things wrong. And so I want you to keep that in mind because I'll come back to that in a few slides. Okay, so how does human factors relate back to what we started this talk with, which is simulation and debriefing? And so we'll return to these drill down questions. And now I actually want to walk you through how these drill down questions might play out in a debriefing in the context of human factors. So let's take, for example, a negative outcome. Um, perhaps a team did not institute an intervention that was clinically indicated, um, or they um, did something improperly, incorrectly. So 
we've covered that in our first question, what happened? Um, this is a little bit of a generic situation, but perhaps think about a mistake um, that you might have been involved in or become aware of. And you can use that as your foundation, your starting point in this exercise. But I want to focus now on what circumstances led to that. And if we use the human factors construct of cognitive, physical, and organizational human factors, we can actually break down the answers and put them into buckets, um, the answers that you might get in a debriefing to this question. So from a cognitive perspective, maybe you'll have team members say, oh, well, I, we didn't do that because I was distracted. Um, or I was unaware that there was a change in the patient's vital signs. From a physical perspective, maybe it was, I knew what I needed to do, but I couldn't reach a particular piece of equipment, or I wasn't in the right position to perform that procedure effectively, or I wasn't in the right location at the patient's bedside to be the one to do that. And then from an organizational perspective, you might hear answers like, well, I didn't know who the team leader was, but it wasn't clear to me what we should be doing. Or I was unsure of how to escalate my concerns about that situation. Um, or even bringing in the concept of a, a family member. Maybe a family member had concerns, but they weren't sure how to speak up. And so now, we would, in the debriefing, we'd go to, okay, what happened to the patient as a result, bringing that back to our team goal. But again, here, I want to focus on the human factors component of this debriefing drill down, because what's most important is even more than recognizing that a mistake occurred or that shortcomings in the team um, uh, became manifest. The thing that we want to focus on and leave this debriefing with is what were the strategies or solutions that this team can come up with to prevent this negative event from happening again, whether that's in the next sim or when the, that team is out taking care of a real patient? So here we have our answers. What were the circumstances? But now the next question is, what can be done to prevent that? So from a cognitive perspective, we want to think about let's make things easy, make it easy to do things correctly and hard to do things wrong. From a cognitive perspective, you might hear answers like, well, because we were distracted, let's find ways to decrease the amount of data that's being communicated to that one individual team member. Or perhaps we need to just completely reallocate how tasks were being performed by each of the members in that team so that we can um, allow people to have a little bit more bandwidth to become aware of things like a change in vital signs. From a physical perspective, a little bit more one-to-one, um, -one, but I couldn't reach a piece of equipment. Well, let's reposition that equipment around the bed rather than saying that person needs to find a way to get around the bedside or get around a piece of equipment. They need to actually have easier access to it. Um, or we need to optimize the positioning of team members around in that environment, around that bedside, um, in that clinic room, wherever it may be. And then finally, from an organizational perspective, thinking about we didn't know who the team leader was. Well, let's actually think about how we can redefine the culture of this team, empower everybody on the team to ask who is leading, to know that that's an okay behavior that would enhance this team's performance. Um, we may also need to go back and communicate what the chain of command is for escalating concerns. Again, clarifying what expectations, behavioral expectations are for this team so that they actually have a more um, comprehensive understanding about what's um, the team behavior that's needed to perform optimally in a situation. And then finally, something like if a team member or a family member was unsure about whether or not it was appropriate to even speak up, that's an opportunity to change the culture around how a team functions and perhaps even sitting down with a family and saying, look, this is, we're your medical team. These are our goals. And this is the, the role that you play within this team to help us all achieve best patient care. But I think it's also interesting from a human factors perspective to think about how you might take one mistake or one event um, and break down some of the solutions and use other areas of human factors to support what might seem to be just a cognitive issue. So what do I mean by that? If we have somebody saying, oh, I was unaware of the change in vitals, and we've come up with ideas like, okay, let's decrease the amount of data that somebody is trying to process so that they can actually have the cognitive bandwidth to notice something like a change in vitals. 
it might also be useful and maybe even more effective or more realistic to come up with physical human factor solutions that can support that individual's performance or that team's performance. Um, maybe there needs to be a more effective indication from the monitor that the vital signs are even changing. Um, I think and the work that's been done in terms of alarm fatigue is really essentially a focus on the limitation, the cognitive limitations of individuals, but also the physical limitations of how the um, alarms often sound similar and that people start to tune those out. Maybe it's that we actually need to physically change the position of team members around the bedside, not necessarily for a procedure, but just so that everybody can see, have a line of sight to the vital sign monitor. And then from an organizational perspective, perhaps actually we need to retrain this team and make it more aware that calling for help earlier is a good behavior and getting more people into the room will actually then facilitate things like reallocating tasks among team members. Um, or again, in terms of like a culture shift, empowering all team members to announce vital sign changes and not assume that just one person is in charge of recognizing that and acting upon it. So again, we think about using human factors to make it easy to do things right and hard to do things wrong. I think we often come into simulation and debriefing thinking about how do we prevent mistakes? But as I mentioned before, learning from good performances and high performing teams is also a very valuable lesson. Um, and I think one of the most common things that we see is that when teams perform at a high level, we actually don't con uh, focus on that in the debriefing. We don't concentrate on that and learn from it. Or we allow an answer like, well, we just got lucky or we work together a lot and we know how to work with one another well. But actually stopping and digging down into what were the circumstances that led to that and what can be done to facilitate that same positive event of recurring in the future is really important as well. Because that allows teams to understand strategies and solutions that they may have already come up with that they can intentionally replicate again in the future. So let's think about a, situ a situation and go through the same type of exercise, but now in the context of a positive performance, a positive outcome. And maybe it's that a team perfectly adhered to a patient care protocol or an algorithm um, without any miscommunication or mistakes, or that they were able to make a diagnosis without um, getting distracted or focusing on the wrong piece of data. From a cognitive perspective, they may give you answers like in terms of what were the circumstances that led to that. It might be that I knew the patient care protocol really well in this situation, so it was easy for me to implement it. Um, or referring back to our previous example, I noticed the change in the patient status, and it was um, something that was acted upon immediately. From a physical perspective, it may be um, you may get answers like, well, we had all the equipment that we needed, um, and it was there. Or in this situation, it was really easy for us to physically move this patient, despite the fact that they had multiple IV lines, because they, we had enough personnel at the bedside. Um, from an organizational perspective, perhaps the team leader was clear, so the lines of communication and what was expected in that team was very um, clearly understood. Or again, hearkening back to our previous example, it was easy for a team member or a family member to speak up and to raise their concerns or to add additional information or to add their perspective to a situation. And again, remembering that what's most important is what can be done to facilitate that in the future. We have our answers. What are our strategies? So here, let's just focus on perhaps one example. What can be done to facilitate getting all, you know, all of the necessary equipment available every time? It might be something physical. This equipment is on a cart that has wheels and it's easy to move. And you can just imagine the, the um, opposite that we didn't have equipment available because the equipment is really heavy and it's not on a cart with wheels and it's really hard to get it to the bedside. So you can see how these types of um, answers can go one way or the other. But beyond just the physical human factors, perhaps there was something cognitive that played into this situation that all of the team members were familiar with where equipment is stored. So they knew immediately where to go and they could easily find it when it was needed. And organizationally, we made it easy to do things right 
and hard to do things wrong. So the equipment's always stored in the right place, or I should say in the same place. But similarly, when equipment's broken or not functioning, that gets moved to a different location. So that when, when a person goes to grab a piece of equipment, they don't accidentally grab something that doesn't work. It seems simple, but these aren't the kinds of things that always happen in our real environment. Um, and also another organizational human factor could be that equipment was called for early so that it could be procured in a timely manner. There was ample time in that clinical situation for it to be brought to the bedside and it was available as soon as, as it was needed. Okay. So I hope that I've been able to show you that I think a lot of us bring this concept to simulation and debriefing that it's an opportunity to hone the humans, to make us better and to allow us to practice. And that's very much true. But incorporating human factors into simulation and debriefing is also an opportunity for us to do something that I call interrogate the environment or interrogate the system and really think more broadly around not just what we can do better individually in our own performance, but how can we come up with system solutions that might optimize the way that we're performing in these critical situations that can be really challenging regardless of how well we're trained. And so that um, connects to the last part of this talk, which is simulation-based research. Um, and this is something that I have a lot of passion for, especially in terms of incorporating human factors, because I think there's so much that, that can be done using the simulated environment that can allow us to enhance the clinical environment that we work in. What is simulation-based research? It's using the simulated clinical environment to investigate issues that can be really challenging to study in the real clinical environment because we have a whole host of issues that are related to human subjects research, as I'm sure everybody here knows, but also in terms of standardizing and really understanding what is the role of the humans and the environment that they're working in compared to the physiology that they may be presented with. And so, as you all know, every patient is potentially different. And so the way that we might interact with them as a medical team and as a healthcare professional is gonna vary based on the variables that they present to you as an individual patient and the physiology and the, and the diagnosis and the disease process that you may be trying to manage. Um, in resuscitation or emergency care uh, research, consent is a huge challenge, especially because of the time, but also the unexpected um, nature of resuscitations. It's hard to consent people ahead of time. You know, if, if a catastrophic event were to occur, can we do this type of research during that um, resuscitation? And then also the element of the risk to patient safety or human life, which is completely removed when you're doing simulation-based research and can use a patient simulator or a mannequin. Um, but as I've already alluded to, what I think is very, very valuable around simulation-based research is the fact that we can truly isolate the human behaviors or the system behaviors that we're trying to study um, by standardizing literally everything else around that um, individual or that system. And so let me talk about or give you an example of how that might be done. Um, and so this was a study that I did a number of years ago, but also was a pilot study to the work that I uh, performed in my K08 award that, that Lance mentioned. And, this, and I'm really interested in how do we standardize communication among team members during neonatal resuscitation? Because I think that it will improve our ability to adhere to the resuscitation algorithm, to the NRP algorithm. And so one of the ways that I've looked at this in the simulated environment is thinking about controlling as many variables around communication as I can so that if there is a difference in performance of the team, I can more readily attribute that to the fact that communication occurred in either a standardized or a non-standardized way. And so when I bring this into a simulated um, based simulation-based research setting, the things that we can control are the patient vital signs in their presentation. So when I presented my study teams with a patient, everybody got the exact same patient. It was a 39-weeker who was born by staph C-section for meconium and D-cells, right? Everybody gets that same patient. The obstetrical and perinatal history is the same. The mom has gotten full prenatal care. She doesn't have any risk factors. She hasn't gotten any meds. And then in the simulated environment, the location of the resuscitation equipment is always the same. So now I can't blame it that you know, this one team had trouble finding a laryngoscope when another team found it most readily. It was standardized for that team. The location of the patient monitor, so where to look for the vital signs and get the data they needed about how that patient might be responding to their interventions. 
and the response of the patient to intervention. So again, getting back to, I can standardize the physiology. When the team performs a certain intervention, I can decide exactly how high the heart rate might respond in terms of coming up or going down. And then additional factors that still can influence the performance of a team, like environmental noise. As many of you who may remember chaotic deliveries, it can get really noisy in those rooms with the other teams, anesthesia, OB. In a simulated environment, we actually can take all of that away and it's controlled in every situation. So now we can't say, oh, perhaps the team performed poorly because it was too noisy or they didn't hear one another. Um, and then also other distractors in the room, whether it's other individuals doing things that are unexpected or coming in and in interrupting the team or asking questions. So that really now we've isolated it to what are the communication patterns among the individuals um, in this team and how did those individuals respond to it in the context of the same clinical scenario. So other ways that people have done simulation-based research can also be um, put into these same buckets of cognitive, um, physical, and organ uh, organizational human factors. And so I just want to throw up some examples to really help you guys think about how can we think about these types of things more broadly. Um, again, going back to resuscitation, a lot of these examples come from resuscitation because um, so much of healthcare simulation is focused on emergency situations. But Simple things that could even be translated to other environments, like organize, organizing a resuscitation cart in a way that's more, um, it makes it easier for people to access the supplies that they need. So going in order of um, perhaps airway breathing and circulation in this situation, rather than um, allowing kind of just a random uh, organization of how maybe Biomed put together that, that resuscitation cart can really affect how people perform in an emergency situation. Um, a study out of Cape a number of years ago looked at how um, effective are people at actually auscultating or palpating the heart rate of a neonate during resuscitation. And this study ultimately influenced the NRP algorithm in terms of the recommendations to place EKG leads sooner in a resuscitation, because this study showed that people were actually really terrible at um, accurately assessing either by auscultation or palpation what the neonate's heart rate is. Um, and then finally, things like looking at um, eye tracking and the visual attention. Where are people focusing their attention and where can they perceive data from, especially as we start to do things like introduce more devices and technology into the environment in terms of when we're, we have devices that might be giving people feedback on their performance. Are you performing effective chest compressions? Do you have um, effective ventilation of your patient? Yes, that can be valuable data to have, but how much can people actually perceive and comprehend and incorporate into their performance? From a physical perspective, this is another study that's come out of CAPE looking at um, how well people can or how efficiently and quickly people can um, insert an umbilical venous catheter versus an IO needle for uh, emergency access and neonatal resuscitation. This also influenced the NRP algorithm um, and allowed um, us to incorporate the option of an IO needle as uh, a route of emergency vascular access because it showed that people were much faster with an IO needle than they were with a UVC catheter. Um, and a study that I've done um, as a pilot study, just looking at the fact that when we respond to resuscitations in the delivery room, oftentimes the height of the bed of the radiant warmer is literally at the random height that the housekeepers left it at. And we may not have time to change the height. Um, and I think that many of us come to that situation as the healthcare professionals and just deal with it. But I wanted to ask, does that actually matter? Does that affect how effect, does that affect the efficacy of our chest compressions when we might need to resuscitate a neonate? And so just trying to understand the data around this and to show, is this a factor that we should be thinking about when we come to situations like this? And finally, um, organizational or social human factors. These are things like looking at the organization of teams. So if, the, if a team leader is randomly assigned in the simulated resuscitation, how does that affect the performance of that team? Or how does the size of a team and whether or not they have the um, aid of a decision support tool, something that prompts them with, with what the algorithm is and what they might need to do next, how does that affect their workload during a resuscitation situation? These are all organizational human factors that people are bringing into play and looking at how can we study them and see what their effect is. So I wanna end with this slide and this quote, which I think really sums up a lot of what um, I think human factors brings to healthcare. 
Um, and so it looks, it's a human, it's a, excuse me, it's a discipline that's dedicated to uncovering and correcting the elements of mismatch between people, the tools they have to work with, and the environments in which they work. By identifying and correcting elements of mismatch between system elements, an improvement in patient safety, efficiency, technology adoption, and user experience, as well as a reduction in the need for user training can be achieved. And to go back to James Reason, um, this psychologist who's been so foundational in human factors, his quote that he brings in is, we cannot change the human condition, but we can change the conditions under which humans work. Um, so with that, I have thanks to um, all of the team at CAPE. Lou and Janine have been amazing faculty and colleagues in supporting a lot of the work that I do, as well as our big simulation team of simulation specialists, Rod Galindos, who's our jack of all, all trades and, and lab manager for us, and then Roxanne, who's our admin and who hates pictures, so I don't have one of her. But thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, we have an uh, opportunity for questions from the audience and also through the chat. We'll be monitoring both of those. While everybody's kind of formulating those, Nicole, I wanted to ask, you know, you, you mentioned the analogy to athletes and practice. And, and I, um, I remember hearing of coaches that would make sure that everyone on the team took a turn playing goalie mm -hmm. or playing catcher. Mm -hmm with the goal being that they wanted the entire team to have the perspective of different positions, but also positions that often get the blame you know, mm -hmm. for performance. Yeah. And, and not that anyone blames anybody in a resuscitation, but I'm wondering, is there value or have you tried anything through simulation, mm -hmm. having all the different care providers in different positions so they mm -hmm. understand the value of someone who's just hearing heart rate or has head of bed or airway or the person who's kind of overseeing the entire mm -hmm. process. Yeah, um, that's a really interesting concept. I haven't thought of that, um, but I'll say that probably the the reason that we haven't done that is truly logistics um, in the sense that athletes get to practice every day. The expectation is that they practice every day. Um, and the opportunity to do simulation in the healthcare field is not an everyday thing. I wish it was. And there are certainly centers where um, they may take their resuscitation teams and do quick codes and resuscitation simulations in a very abbreviated fashion on a daily basis, but it's definitely not the standard. And so I think just the bandwidth and the opportunity to practice that type of thing while very valuable is just not a luxury that we have. Um, it does, though. I think bring up something that we've been working hard on in neonatology and that's bringing in multidisciplinary simulations. And we started doing that about um, almost two years ago now, where rather than have people come through CAPE for their NRP training in the groups of individuals that they are, so having the nurse practitioners come through, the fellows come through, the RTs come through and all training with one another, we bring them in now as multidisciplinary teams. So we have at every simulation, we have a neonatology attending, multiple neonatology fellows, neonatal hospitalists, nurse practitioners, um, and the RTs. We're still working on trying to get nurses, but allowing them to come together as the teams that they are so that when they go through these simulations, we don't have people um, acting in roles that they aren't familiar with, but they're actually practicing the roles that they do play or that they do have, I shouldn't say play, that they have in real life. Um, and then in the debriefings, I think it makes the debriefing so much more fruitful because that is the opportunity for people in different roles to hear the perspectives of others on their team. So for example, you may hear an RT say, oh, I didn't know that uh, the attending, didn't, the neonatology attending wasn't even aware of this fact, or that a neonatology attending can say to an RT, I need to hear from you. I need you to speak up because I, I can't see everything and really work on the cultural aspects and the organizational human factors of getting teams to work together in a more effective way by allowing them to understand each other's roles in a more comprehensive fashion. Um, thank you so much for coming to talk mm -hmm. to us. I remember as an intern doing the CAPE training and um, for the NRP, and I, I still believe that that is one of like the more formative simulations that I've ever performed, like ever done. Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, I really love. <laughs> I'm glad it. to and, hear that. Yeah, and seeing it on the screen and being able to debrief it afterwards was really, really helpful. I wish we had more of those trainings, actually. Mm -hmm. um, one of my questions is: It seems like your 
um, your presentation is mainly focused on the the systems um, mm -hmm. and the process, um, which is definitely a very important component of the debriefing. But there's also an element of like emotional debrief in mm -hmm. um, these more real life situations, right? If a child does die or if there's a negative outcome. So I'm wondering if there's been any work that you know of that's already been published or if there's some work in progress to um, understand the uh, impact and um, ways in which we can incorporate that emotional debrief mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, really important question. Um, so there actually is a lot of work done in healthcare simulation um, in looking at kind of the best ways or the most effective ways to debrief teams. And there are definitely um, teams and debriefing um, experts, even within the field, who believe that it's important to start with a question more of like, um, how are you feeling or how did that go? Or what did you guys think of that? Um, the debriefing methodology and the approach that I talked about here is very much something that um, we at CAPE believe it's important to actually separate the technical performance from the emotional and what we call critical incident stress debriefing, because trying to combine the two can be really challenging and can actually impact the efficacy of debriefing either aspect of that situation. And so from a technical performance debriefing perspective, I think it's really important to try to focus on the actions of the team and the circumstances around that, what led to that, how can they come up with strategies or solutions for the future, um, and recognize that debriefing the emotions and discussing kind of how a team may have been impacted by a critical situation is very important, but actually we don't have the skill sets as healthcare professionals oftentimes to even do that. And maybe that's where we need to bring in psychologists or social work support to actually help people really dig down into their emotions or their reactions to a situation. Nicole, thank you so much mm -hmm. to you and your team for all of the work you do in education and um, improving the care we provide to patients. This is fabulous. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you could speak about your role or the uh, CAPE's role in training the next generation of providers who are going to be attending these deliveries and trying to resuscitate babies and specifically around resident and fellow education. What do you see as next steps and frontiers in simulation-based research? Oh my goodness, that's a great question. Um, well, so I think one of the things that we already are trying to do and really have a, an emphasis on is that when the residents come through CAPE for NRP training, we um, to perhaps to your logistical chagrin are limiting the size of the groups that come because based on the time that we have with them, we really want to make um, sure that there's an opportunity for every resident to be in the leadership role of running those situations, knowing that when they leave residency as a pediatrician, they're going to enter situations where they're expected to be the ones who lead those types of situations. And so bringing them in um, and giving them the opportunity to practice that role and kind of be a little bit on the hot seat as a, a code leader in, that, in those situations is really important. Um, I um, agree, though, that I think a lot of the challenge that we're seeing as pediatric training is evolving is that the decrease in time that residents have in the NICU is really affecting their ability to practice things like procedures. We're seeing that filter up into the um, the fellows and the nurse practitioners as well. And I actually think that incorporating simulation in a more frequent fashion is something that can be really valuable so that when um, uh, residents or trainees are put into a situation where they actually have to perform a procedure or operate as a team, they've already had the practice through simulation to be able to perform at a higher level. And so rather than coming into the situation as a truly as a learner and trying to learn and integrate all of those things, perhaps for the first time under pressure, they've actually had more exposure to that in simulation. Nicole, I'm going to check the chat, but while we're doing okay. that, you mentioned your project about standardization of communication. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit, when the first time I've heard you mention this, I thought during uh, resuscitation, I just assumed that the communication would be pretty standard. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but clearly it's not always. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit about what do you mean by standardization of mm -hmm. communication and, and have you learned anything so far from your research? In yeah. That? Um, so what I mean by standardized communication is really first recognizing that even in the way that we learn about content and learn about resuscitation, for example, in NRP or in PALS, 
a huge proportion of the, the educational program is focused on the content. So just knowing what, learning what the algorithm is and the technical skills, how to do certain procedures or interventions. And there isn't actually a whole lot incorporated into that education on how do teams function with one another and how do they interact as team members? Excuse me. And so thinking about standardizing communication is one way I think we can emphasize those behavioral skills to allow teams to function more effectively together. Um, and I compared communication and resuscitation to communication in aviation. Um, and one of the, the contrasts that I make in a lot of the talks that I do that specifically focus on my research is I'll throw up a script of the miracle on the Hudson landing where the Captain Sully had to land this plane with no power on the Hudson River and compare that to a script from a resuscitation and looking at the patterns of communication and how succinct and standardized that pilot and those air traffic controllers were in this emergency situation compared to the variability that we have in healthcare around communication and resuscitation. And so one of the examples that I think that's most readily accessible to people, even if you aren't um, a neonatologist, is, is communicating about the heart rate. And when we go to medical school or nursing school, we're taught the way that you assess a patient's heart rate is you listen to their heart rate for six seconds, and then you multiply that number by 10. And if you think about actually trying to get people to do that in a real time pressured environment with high stress, doing that type of math even can be challenging. Um, not to mention the fact that people are actually not really that um, effective, as I mentioned, at auscultating or palpating accurate heart rate. And so one of the strategies that I brought to standardizing communication was the decision points in NRP are whether or not the heart rate is above 100 or below 100. That determines whether or not we need to start PPV. And above 60 or below 60, that determines if we should be starting chest compressions. And so rather than allowing people to rely on their own training and perhaps try to count the heart rate and say, oh, I think it's 80 or I think it's 95 or maybe it's 130, teaching them the only ways that I want to hear you communicate about the heart rate is above 100, below 100, or below 60. Um, and even people who are really experienced in resuscitation, they've actually started to incorporate that thought process. They've changed their cog cognitive structure around that. And they, you know, our neonatal hospitalists will often say, I can like see somebody tapping and I don't need to know what the number is. I know whether that's above 100, below 100, or below 60. And so really teaching people to standardize their communication so that as team members, I can go into any situation and know what I'm going to hear from other team members about what the heart rate is. And similarly, I have now distilled down into three categories the way that I'm going to communicate about heart rate to the rest of my colleagues. We got a number of uh, questions in the chat. So uh, the first question is, um, there's a lot of uh, tech come to simulation with ever increasing mannequin realism, et cetera, often mm -hmm. the distraction. Do any opinions or insight on the future technology to further the debriefing process? Anything new beyond video or uses of video? There's a lot in that question. So I think as far as mannequin technology, the way that um, I think about it and the way that we think about it as CAPE is, it really depends on what the learning objectives are of the people who are using those mannequins and coming um, to you for simulation. Yes, there is a ton of technology being done from the perspective of making more realistic mannequins and giving them more realistic um, capabilities, but it really matters what how that affects your ability to teach and um, interact with those mannequins in a way that affects your patient care. So to be honest, there are mannequins, for example, that are coming out that are much more realistic in terms of the way they look compared to um, humans, adult humans. Um, it, there's also neonatal mannequins that are more realistic. There's even one that has hair. And I think about probably all the R&D that went into getting realistic looking hair on this neonatal mannequin. And from my perspective, it doesn't matter. Like we never do anything in patient care in neonatology that really intricately involves realistic hair. Um, and so those are the kinds of features that I think really look cool in terms of allowing somebody to walk up to that patient and say, this looks like a real patient, but is that actually necessary to the efficacy of our simulation-based learning? Probably not. Um, in terms of video, I think video is something that people can really um, 
leverage and probably still don't as much as they could, but it, that is also growing in terms of using that as a real record of what happened because debriefing um, or talking about an event and trying to recall from memory what happened or in what order things occurred or who said what at what time is really challenging. And you can actually spend a lot of time in debriefing arguing over who said what first rather than the content of what happened and some of the, and learning from some of the strategies that um, might be related to um, the performance of that team in that situation. Uh, thank you. The next one is, uh, do you think there's a role to do simulations with parents of medically complex babies uh, for discharge teaching? Oh, for sure. There are centers that are definitely doing that. Um, we are not yet doing that at Cape because we don't quite have the capacity for that. But I know, for example, that um, there are centers on the East Coast that do trach teaching um, and trach simulation with families. And part of like their overnight stay prior to discharge is um, one step in that learning process is doing simulation-based care for trach changes or trach emergencies for, um, for babies and children. Uh, there's another question. It says, not all of us function well under time pressure, mm -hmm. regardless of practice. Yep. Uh, what techniques work well for helping those individuals' performance under pressure with multiple distractions? Are there lessons to include from aerospace or military human factors research? Yeah. So I think that's a really insightful question because I think that gets to the fact that we all definitely have limitations. Um, and I think where simulation and human factors, sometimes you're walking a fine line is that there definitely still is a role within simulation to allow people to practice and to actually even potentially expose themselves to challenging situations so that the stress or of time pressure, for example, you can become a little bit desensitized to that. So there's a role in really just going through simulation and, and having that experience so that you as an individual can come up with your own strategies that might facilitate you performing at a higher level in that situation. But that also dovetails, as I've as I've talked about with human factors, because just relying solely on an individual to change or improve themselves is probably not going to get the highest performance out of that person or even the team that they're involved in. And recognizing that there are other systemic or environmental factors that can also be changed to support them so that perhaps things like what was mentioned is a lot of data coming at an individual can actually be optimized or changed so that the team and the individual understand how to best process everything that might be coming at them in that environment in order to take care of a patient in that situation. The next question is actually interesting because I personally, I feel more anxiety for a simulation mm -hmm. than an actual real delivery, mm -hmm. I have to admit. Yeah. And so the question is, how do you address or overcome the anxieties that clinicians may have or that the vulnerabilities that they may feel about participating in simulations with colleagues, especially early on in their careers? Yeah, that is a good question. So I think a lot of around simulation is knowing that what comes after the simulation is the debriefing, right? That we're actually going to talk and and pick apart perhaps um, the performance. Um, and I think what really is valuable and something that we try to do in, in, in advance of all of our simulation programs at CAPE is set the stage for what the expectations are for that simulation. Why are we doing that simulation? Why are you here? And one of the ways that we phrase it is, we have some challenging situations for you today. And the purpose of that is to help you learn. Because if you come in here and perform in a simulation that's really easy, and you haven't really um, improved your overall performance as an individual or team, then we haven't done anything to help you. And we've wasted your time and we've wasted our time as the sim team because we're not taking advantage of all that simulation can offer. And so I think actually shifting the mindset is really key to allowing people to be open to that learning and to understand that the purpose of a simulation is actually to try to make mistakes, try to create environments in which people make mistakes so that they can learn from them. But that's why we're here, that we don't want to have just a smooth sailing situation because there's not as much to learn from those situations as um, uh, when you're challenged. And similarly, the aspect of um, confirming and reassuring people that what happens in simulation and in the and discussed in the debriefing is confidential. And so that's also why, for those of you who come through CAPE multiple times, we make you sign the confidentiality agreement every time you come to CAPE. It's because we want to re-emphasize that what's discussed in this in the debriefing is confidential and that for you know individuals who may be as was mentioned early in your training there's a little bit of a power dynamic perhaps with working with more experienced or senior colleagues that what we talk about is 
something that stays in that environment for the benefit of the people that are there for them to learn and talking about performance outside of a stressful environment um, in a simulation that we know we challenged individuals with, talking about that outside of that environment is not okay. Thank you so much, Nicole. Yeah. It was a wonderful presentation. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, everybody, for attending, everybody on Zoom, and for all Thank the great you. questions. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.